and know now that I found this handy dandy little um, button, even if you speak, the camera does not go to your screen. It won't record you and your face. It's just your voice. When we left off last week, I was starting to tell you about how we measure a person's renal function. And tonight we get into the math of that. And my son wanted to get on with you all and give you all an announcement. And I told him no. And here's what he wanted to say. Grab your Wednesday whiskey, folks. It's going to be a lot of math and a long lecture. And I was <laughs> shushing him off my computer saying, no, you're not going to say that because it shouldn't be that long of a lecture, but it is going to be a lot of math tonight. And I said, probably they've already had their Wednesday whiskey if they've been watching the election returns and <laughs> the nail biting that's occurring. So yep, yep. Um, it's all very exciting. Um, I, I love me a good race, I have to say. I like the competition. But we left, we left off, we left... <laughs> Part of me is looking forward to the next two weeks and all of the meltdowns. Oh, I'm just right. Okay. Okay. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Can't wait. <laughs> Who know, exactly. How much can you say? Yes. Agreed. Okay. Uh, I'll agree. Yes. Okay. I'm highly entertained by him. Anyway. Yes, what, um, what? So anyway, um, we left off me telling you about four scenarios uh, substance A, B, C, and D. And I used those four scenarios to reiterate knowing a substance's fate, meaning what happens to it. If it's in the, if it's in the plasma, can it be filtered? Because if it can't be filtered in the first place, it's not going to show up in the urine. Can it be filtered and nothing else happens to it? Well, if that's the case, then however much you filter is going to show up in the urine the same rate. <clears throat> is it filtered and partially reabsorbed? Well, then you're going to have less of it come out in the urine compared to what you filtered. Is it filtered and 100% reabsorbed? Then under normal circumstances, none of it should come out in the urine. Is it filtered, but also secreted? And that means some of that substance is pulled from the peritubular capillary bed and then pushed into the filtrate. It escaped a filtra a filtration, but got pulled into the filtrate through a second, secondary way. <clears throat> When we left off last week, I also told you how to calculate filtered load, also known as tubular load. Those are synonyms. And we're talking about how much of a substance goes with the fluid, the volume, into Bowman's capsule. And I want you to think of Bowman's capsule as Bowman's cup. And we used serving a drink and how much alcohol content you got in that drink as our example of filtered load, right? You could tell an officer, I only had one. Yeah, but if the one you had is the size of your head, then you had a lot more alcohol loading. If it's 10% alcohol and you drank a thousand milliliters, if you had a liter sized drink, then you had 100 milliliters of alcohol that came along with that fluid. So that's filtered load. And with filtered load, the units are milligrams per, per minute. That's, it's a rate, milligram per minute. Now, <clears throat> excretion is also a rate. Notice here that it also has units of milligrams Per minute. And there are a couple of ways we can calculate excretion. Here's one way, and it's the longer way. It requires more math. This equation that you're seeing here that I'm highlighting in a yellow box is the master equation. 
the master. It is the master equation because this equation single-handedly explains renal function. We, we know that the kidneys have, they play several roles in our body. They have many responsibilities, but one of their biggest responsibilities is filtering your plasma, removing waste particles, adjusting your pH, removing excessive electrolytes, having too much sodium or too much potassium can be a bad thing. Saving electrolytes, maybe you're on a very low sodium diet and now your kidneys are trying to save sodium and not let as much go into the toilet through your urine. So this is the master equation and it basically says Whatever you pee, that's excretion, is, is factored by, can that substance be filtered? What other fate happens to it besides filtration? Is it secreted? Is it reabsorbed? So excretion of a substance how much of that substance comes out in your urine? What do you pee out? Is derived by how much of it is filtered, how much do you reabsorb, if at all, and how much do you secrete, if at all? This is where knowing the fate of a substance can actually save you from doing more math. Here's what I mean. If you know a substance is filtered and secreted, but then not reabsorbed, then that part of the equation goes away. There's less math to figure out. And we, we, we as students, we love doing less math, don't we? We do. So look out for that. Always put in check what am I playing with? What substance am I dealing with right now? What part of this equation does not apply to this substance? It is going to take some practice and that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to practice. It's going to take some time, but we will get there. So this is our master equation. Almost all roads either start from this or lead to it. It's almost like a circle. Filtered load, I showed you how to calculate that last week. We take GFR, which is the amount of plasma filtered into Bowman's capsule per minute. It has the units milliliter per minute times the plasma concentration. Now, last week I said to you, we can collect urine, we can draw blood, we can send those samples to the lab and they will give us pages of data. They will give us lots of information like for the blood, how many formed, um, how many red blood cells do we have? A differential for white blood cells. How much sodium do we have in the plasma? How much glucose? How many lipids? Cholesterol, HDL, LDL, pages of data. Similarly, with urine analysis, they, it can tell us how much urea is in the urine, how much creatinine, how much sodium comes out in the urine, how much albumin, if at all, albumin is not supposed to be filtered. So we get pages of data. So we can determine plasma concentration real easily. We can draw blood, send it to the lab, and for any substance we wanna know about, they will tell us how many milligrams per milliliter that particular substance happens to be found in the patient's blood. This is not a new concept for you. One of the first wet labs we did together as a class was on spectrophotometry and you had to use a spectrophotometer with a standard curve to figure out the plasma concentration 
of a substance in your patient's blood. So we started out teaching you about how a, a typical clinical lab can figure out concentrations of substances in blood and in urine. Please look carefully at this equation I'm underlining right now. It is, it is the same equation as our master equation. It is. It's just rearranged. I have solved for secretion instead of excretion. Be ready to manipulate equations like this. Be ready to rearrange them to solve for excretion, secretion, reabsorption. All you have to do is rearrange the equation, get the item you want to solve for on by itself on one side of the equal sign. This actually was somewhat problematic for a few of you on your lecture exam number three. Some of you had, I, I mean, I know you know how to do this. I know you do. I chalk it up to the stress of the exam Taking exams all online is not easy. But here's what I mean, why some of you had a hard time with this. That equation was on your lecture exam, but I asked you to solve for pressure. And there were quite a few of you that could not recognize that pressure, if you solved for it, would be flow times resistance. When we rearrange an equation, that's what I like to call it. It's the same furniture in your room. You're just rearranging your room. You're putting the bed on the other wall. But in math speak, in math speak, we use things like the associative and communicative properties of math. I, I, can, I know, I can use those words, but I don't think you want me to. But be ready to isolate a factor that you're solving for by itself on one side of the equal sign. Be ready to rearrange the furniture in your room. I know that's a corny way of explaining it, but it works. Now down here, here is another way to calculate excretion. I can calculate excretion using the master equation. I can also calculate excretion of a substance using a shorter equation. These two are the same. Urine flow rate. Urine flow rate, it actually should be V with a dot over it. Dot over it means it's a flow. Mm -hmm. Urine flow rate is the volume of urine coming out of your kidneys through the ureter to your bladder and ultimately out of your body per minute. So it's units are milliliters per minute. What else was a flow rate that you saw on the screen? GFR. And then urine concentration for any substance is basically the same thing as plasma concentration. It's going to have the units in milligrams per milliliter. Notice that the equation for filtered load, what goes in, is the same type of equation for excretion, what comes out. It's a matter of how much volume and what's coming along with that volume. So these are equations that you're going to see on the very last slide of this PowerPoint. One of the few that you're expected to memorize. One of the few that you're also expected to know how to manipulate to solve 
questions that ask you about your patient's renal health, renal function. How well are they filtering their blood? How well are waste products coming out in the urine? Now here's another term, renal clearance value, RCV. I'm gonna tell you what it is, and then I'm going to tell you a story about my kids. It's corny, but it, 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 I hate to make it all about my family and my kids, but this is a true story that I'm going to tell you. Most of them actually are true. Can't think of a time when I've lied to you, but um, it's, a, it's a, students find it very entertaining, this story. I'll just put it that way and I'll hurry up and get to the story. Renal clearance value is a volume of plasma that is cleansed, cleared, scrubbed free of a substance in a certain amount of time. How can we relate that to every day? You can think of this as if you were at a party and you were drinking alcohol and you didn't, you didn't have for whatever reason, you didn't want to take an Uber, you wanted to drive home, but you were going to be responsible. And you had calculated your body mass, how much alcohol you consumed, and you knew how long you had to wait in order to drive such that you would be below that legal limit where you would not be considered impaired. You get the idea, right? Why do you have to wait so much time? You have to wait so much time for alcohol to be cleared from your plasma. Now, of course, it's cleared from your plasma, both through your kidneys and your liver, but let's just focus on the kidneys. Let's say you had to wait so many hours so that your kidneys can clear the alcohol out of your bloodstream and into your urine. Renal clearance value is the volume of plasma cleared, cleansed, scrubbed free of any particular substance in a unit of time. That's saying a lot. And for some of you, you're like, okay, I get it. Some of you are like, no, I don't get it. So here's my story. And it's a true story. I can bring Mac in here and he can verify. So when the boys were younger, um, Hayden, my oldest, is four years, four and a half years older than Mac. And Mac is now 17 and Hayden is going to be 22. Um, because they were four and a half years difference in age, they didn't really do things together. Hayden had friends that were much older than Mac and Mac's friends. And so usually when we would have kids over for both the boys for play dates and things like that. It was the older boys and younger boys. I would call them the biggins and the little ones. Big guys, little guys. And they didn't really usually interact. They just kept to themselves. Big guys would do big guy stuff, usually playing basketball. And then the little guys would usually be doing little guy things like either playing with Legos it depends on what age they were at. Every once in a while, they would have what I would call a good brother day where the planets aligned and Hayden and his friends would actually play with the little guys and everyone got along and it was so easy. And I actually worked very hard to get more of those days to happen. Um, in particular, to give you an example, on Fridays, Fridays usually I, I don't teach. 
Fridays on occasion, I have meetings that I have to go to, but most Fridays I would spend cleaning the house, doing schoolwork, prepping for the next week. Um, but one of the things I love to do would be go to the grocery store and get ready for the boys to be dismissed from school. And at the grocery store, I would get potato chips, big sandwiches. Vaughn's have five, has $5 Fridays where they make these big, uh, like Subway sandwich types of, of big deli sandwiches with deli meats. I just love it with fresh French bread. I'd get pizza, I'd get gummy bears, I'd get juice boxes, I'd get bubble waters, I'd get 7-Up, I would get uh, just a whole spread, cookies, and I have a galley kitchen. I don't have an island, I just have a long counter. Love my galley kitchen because then I would set up all of this food and I'd have plates on one end and all the food lined up. And Hayden and Mac, and eventually all of their friends knew that it was Friday feast day. My house was the house that all the kids would want to go to, mostly because of the food that I would have. I'm not stupid. <laughs> so the boys usually pick them up on Friday and, it, and then it would start. Mom, can so-and-so come over? Yep. Mom, can so-and-so come over? Yep. Can I have three friends come over? Absolutely. Can I have four friends come up? Absolutely. Tell the friends, go tell their moms. I'll take as many as I can or their moms can drop them off. Absolutely. So I'd have a household of kids, so many of them. And on occasion, we'd have these good brother days where again, it wasn't just brother and brother playing nicely, but their friends playing nicely. And usually when we had these good brother days, this is what they would play. And I'm getting, pay attention, pay attention because there's a quiz at, this, at the end of this story. Usually what they would play would be some sort of um, tag game. Let me explain. Mac and Hayden were fans of Star Wars. And when they were younger, they had every single lightsaber imaginable, every color with every handle. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't know half of them. I, Hayden or Mac would challenge me to a lightsaber duel. We had the ones that lit up. We had the ones that were just plastic, but didn't light up. We had the ones that lit up and, and made sounds every time you moved it. Vroom, vroom. And if you hit it against another one, it would clash. And they would challenge me to a duel and they would say, mom, you be Darth Vader. <laughs> Being an idiot, I'd go pick one up and they'd be like, no. That's Darth Sidious's lightsaber. How dare you? That's not, I don't know. You're going to have to show me. So then I pick up a different one. That's Yoda's. That's green. You don't even know. No, I don't know. I really don't know. So tell, just give me one. <laughs> <laughs> so we had all of these lightsabers. We also had every Nerf gun imaginable as well. Nerf guns. We had Nerf guns that would fire one bullet at a time. We had Nerf guns that had a chamber for Nerf bullets where you had to cock the chamber and it would fire one bullet at a time. But at least you had this, this chamber of bullets, right? Stockpile versus the one where you had to load the bullet and fire it. Okay, so we had single load fire. We had chamber of bullets that you could fire. We had guns that had chambers, you know, clips of bullets, I guess clips is the better thing, and could do rapid fire because it was battery operated. Okay, are you, are you visual? And then we had every different kind of Nerf bullet. There are the Nerf bullets that are the foam sticks with the plastic tip, the foam sticks with the plastic tip that glow in the dark, the foam sticks with the plastic tip that has Velcro so that it sticks. So if you were wearing the little shield and you hit someone, it would stick and you would say, I got you. 
the ones with the foam sticks plastic tip with Velcro that glowed in the dark in case you were playing, you know, shooting tag in the dark. We had the Nerf guns that fired the round discs that were orange or the round discs that were green and glowed in the dark. I think you get the idea. All these Nerf guns. So these good brother days usually turned into, they would have these Nerf gun wars. And it wouldn't be the big guys against the little guys. They would actually mingle and split the teams evenly. So there would be an even number of big guys and little guys on both teams. When they started to sort themselves out and prepare for these Nerf wars, my job was to go through the entire house, open every single set of windows, even the ones on the second floor, open the shutters, open the windows, take off the screens, insert fire ladders off of all of the bedroom windows. I would also be in charge of opening every single door and screen door downstairs, every single garage door, side door, and gates. Gates out to the front, gates out to the park. We back up to a park. The dog, we only had one dog back in this day, the dog would lose her mind. She would hear the boys in McLean's room getting ready, separating, and they all got to pick, they all got to pick a single fire Nerf gun, a Nerf gun that had a chamber of bullets, but it was still single fire, and a Nerf gun that had a clip of bullets, but was rapid fire. We had that many. They all also got to pick a lightsaber. And here's the idea. It was basically like a paintball kind of war, but with Nerf guns, okay? And if you ran out of bullets and you had to defend yourself, you could deflect the Nerf bullets, okay? And your, the idea was the team that had the last man standing won. The dog would lose her mind because she's a border collie. And she knew that once this game started, there would be easily about 20 kids running through, to, out, up the stairs, down the stairs, out second, second story windows, down fire ladders, out into the park, hiding in trees in the park. And her job as a border collie, well, her job was to try and herd them all. No. <laughs> it was chaos. It was such fun. And none of the boys, none of the boys liked having Rooney, that was that's her name, play because she, if they tried to hide, she of course would find them. <laughs> and she'd lay down and bark. And so then the other team would absolutely know where you were. So the, it was real fun. They had to not only evade the other team, <clears throat> but evade the dog. <clears throat> so kids and dog running all through the house. Friday, Friday afternoon, well, my job was done. There was nothing else for me to do except pour a glass of wine the size of my head, sit on the couch and watch the fun. So this would go on until they were all done playing last person standing team one. And, and then they would all jump in the pool to cool off. If they hadn't already jumped in the pool from the second story window, from my bedroom window, it's a clean, easy shot into the deep end. Oh. So that was the craziness. Now, how does this relate to renal clearance value? Okay, well, I'm going to stand up because this is usually what I would do if we were face to face. And I'd be in front of you all. And I would say to you all, at the end of this playtime, when the kids were swimming and having fun in the pool, I would start to pick things up. And I would just kind of throw things in McLean's room 
in an organized way because the boys would help me put things away. And I would throw all the bullets over here. I would throw all the Nerf guns over here and all the lightsabers in another pile, but on McLean's floor. Once all the friends went away, McLean usually would come upstairs with me and help me clean up. Now here's where I want you to visualize. This is, this is the quiz. McLean was a little guy and he would, he would help me clean up. I would put him in charge of picking up his lightsabers and he would put them away in the closet and he liked to have them arranged just so like from bad guy to good guy <clears throat> in a rainbow color assortment. So I want you to visualize McLean <clears throat> bending over and picking up one lightsaber at a time. I want you to visualize me over here with all of the Nerf bullets. And I am bending over and picking up one Nerf bullet at a time. So visualize Mac and I bending over, picking up one item at a time off the floor of McLean's room. The lightsabers are over here in a pile on the floor. The bullets are over here on a pile on the floor. We're both bending over and picking up one of these items at an equal rate. Which person, McLean or myself, will clear their carpet space of that toy. Mac? Why? Um, See, there's the quiz. He had to pay attention. Is there less lightsabers than there are bullets? Correct. Now, who was that? Because I don't have your pretty little faces. <laughs> it was Alyssa. Alyssa. <laughs> it was who? Alyssa. OK. So you listened and you knew that uh, there were mo more bullets because you heard me say that each kid got three Nerf guns. And you knew that at least two of those three guns had a clip that stored a lot of bullets. So you knew that there were a lot more bullets than lightsabers because each kid got one lightsaber. Each kid got three guns, and two of those three had clips, chambers that stored bullets. So good job. Renal clearance, used in my analogy, the amount of carpet cleared of a toy per minute. Mac will clear his space of carpet at a faster rate than I will. Can you all visualize that? Uh -huh. Okay, now he, let me up the game. Hayden would come upstairs and he would also help. And sometimes his friend Evan would still be there and he would come and help as well. So I, I now had two big guys helping me pick up the bullets. So now it's me, Hayden and Evan and we're bending over, picking up bullets, as Mac is bending over, picking up lightsabers. All of us are bending over and picking up one item at a time at an equal speed. Now, who will clear a section of carpet of that particular toy faster? Is, it, a, is it equal? Is it a little bit more challenging now to answer that question? Now we need the math. <laughs> now you need to know exactly how many kids came over that day, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Because if each one got three guns and two of them had multiple bullets, you I never told you exactly how many kids were over. I said easily I could have up to 20. Yeah. It wasn't always 20. No. 
So that question was harder for you to answer because you didn't know the starting amount. That is why. Mm -hmm. The first question I asked you, it was easy for you all to think about because it was one against one. And you knew a finite amount of lightsabers, one per kid, no more than 20, but bullets, that could have been 120. It could have been 520 bullets, right? I never told you how many bullets the clips could hold. So when it was Mac versus me, it was easier for you to figure out he's gonna clear his section of carpet sooner than Kara. But when I got help, it was a little bit more challenging because you needed to know how much I started with. You wanted to do that math. Okay, now there's three of them against Mac. Okay, how, you know, could they finish at the same time? Depends on how much we started with. Can we figure out how much we started with in a real clinical setting? If renal clearance is the amount of plasma, carpet, cleared of a substance, toys, per minute, can we count, can we, figure out how much we started with in the first place. Yeah. Can we draw blood? Can we send that to the lab? Can they tell us how much is in the blood? Yeah. Can we determine how much of that plasma is cleared of a substance? Yeah. Why? How? Well, if the plasma is cleared of something by the kidneys, where is it gonna go? Where does it go? Uh, the urine? Absolutely the urine, absolutely. So can we collect urine? Absolutely. Yeah. Can we send it to the lab and they can tell us how much of something came out in it? Oh yeah, very easily. So now I'm going to show you the equation of renal clearance value. What you start with, what you start with compared to what comes out. If it's coming out, then that means it's not in the body as much, correct? You've cleared. So here's your renal clearance equation. Renal clearance equation is, and remember, this is milliliters of plasma cleared of something per minute, some sort of solute cleared of something. Lightsabers, plastic bullets. What comes out? That's your excretion rate. That's your urine flow rate times the urine concentration. What comes out divided by what you started with? what you had in your plasma. Can we draw blood and send it to the lab and they tell us what we started with? Absolutely. Can we collect urine and send it to the lab and they can tell us how much urine we got and how much of a particular substance came out with it? Absolutely. It's not hard to do. We do it all the time. So now that we, und well, now that we're beginning to understand what renal clearance is, a volume of plasma cleansed, cleared of a particular substance per minute. Well, if the plasma is scrubbed clean of something, where is it going? Bye-bye, out to the toilet, out in the urine. We're getting rid of it. So I, I need us to go back now and understand some of the terms that I taught you last week that you probably weren't really focused on. Pretend you have one kidney. Pretend you have one nephron. Pretend you have one Bowman's capsule attached to that one nephron. Pretend you have one glomerulus, that the blood 
entering your renal artery to all the renal vessels leading to that glomerulus. Here's your afferent arterial. Here's your efferent. Pretend you have one afferent arterial leading to that one glomerulus and one efferent arterial coming off of the glomerulus to the peritubular capillary. You just have one. And last week you learned about ERPF, effective renal plasma flow, the amount of plasma going to, through, and out of the kidney for the sake of being filtered, not the amount of plasma delivering nutrition nor oxygen. And that number was 594 milliliters per minute. A typical GFR is 125 milliliters per minute. That means 469 milliliters per minute of plasma escaped filtration. If you want, you can pretend that all of these little dots, let's say some nasty, nasty thing that you ate you didn't wash your fruit, let's say it's pesticides. And you got some of those nasty pesticides to be filtered, but because 469 milliliters of plasma didn't get filtered, some of those pesticides escaped filtration. It might take several times through the kidneys several times for your entire plasma supply to eventually be cleared of those pesticides. Because in this picture, the pesticides are only being filtered. Nothing else is happening to them. They are not being reabsorbed. They are not being secreted. So it might take several passages of your plasma to go through your kidneys to get something completely cleared from your plasma if its fate is that it's only filtered. It's gonna take some time. So let's explore that. Let's explore a substance that is filtered only. Let's start there, okay? We're gonna start our math now. What are we playing with? A substance that is filtered only. That's like me trying to clean up all those bullets and I have no help. It's going to take me a lot longer than Mac who only has a few lightsabers. It's just me. I don't have any help. I don't have Evan and I don't have Hayden to help me. So here's my, here's my substance arriving in my glomerulus and it's being filtered and it's entering Bowman's capsule and it's on the way to the toilet. Nothing else is happening to it. It's not being secreted and it's not being reabsorbed. Notice I'm using my mastery equation and I'm making the math easier on me. It's not being secreted it's not being reabsorbed. No other fate except it's filtered. And now look at my equation. It's much simpler. Excretion equals filtration. That's what I'm left with. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, I need you to remember this. What substance follow, has this fate where it's filtered only and because it's filtered only whatever is filtered comes out in the urine whatever i filter comes out in the urine they're equal what goes in will equal what comes out and the substance that i started to introduce last week was inulin inulin is a polysaccharide a lot like starch okay it's a storage molecule of sugars for plants like garlic, um, onions. So it's a sugar, it's a storage sugar for plants. And 
it's not something you can digest. It's a lot like fiber in our diet, okay? We cannot digest it. It is filtered, but it is not reabsorbed. It is not secreted. That is the reason why on my previous slide, I crossed those off of my master equation. I crossed them off. So why, why am I telling you about inulin? We use it in a clinical setting. Why? Because of its fate. It's filtered only. How is that useful? How is it useful that it's filtered only? That's the next thing I have to tell you. Because of its fate, because it's filtered only, we can actually use inulin in a patient to calculate their actual GFR. Remember last week I said a normal GFR is 125 milliliters per minute. But is it in your patient? Are they filtering that much? I told you the story of our family friend that tried to take her life and has probably done significant permanent kidney damage. I told you about her. She's pretty young. I mean, I, I'm 50 plus, I consider myself still young. She's my age, but she now has kidney function that looks more like she's 70 to 80. It's not okay. So we use inulin because of its fate, it's filtered only. And my job, my job, not your job, is to now mathematically prove to you why inulin, due to its fate, can be used to calculate someone's actual GFR, their glomerular filtration rate. And it's a very non-invasive way. Do you remember? Do you remember when I told you about Stephen Hales and how he determined blood pressure in a horse by sticking a large needle into the horse's carotid artery? Do you remember that? Yes. Aren't you glad that we have a non-invasive way to determine your blood pressure now? Yes. Absolutely. Less pain means our patients are more compliant. If we didn't have inulin, how would we calculate, how would we measure someone's GFR? Here's what we would have to do. We would have to stick a catheter with some sort of probe that can measure fluid going by it. We would have to stick it up our patient's urethra into their bladder up through their ureter into the renal pelvis, into a major calyx, into a minor calyx, up through a renal papilla, up through a papillary duct, up through a medullary duct, up through a collecting duct, up through a collecting tubule, up through a connecting tubule, back through a late, dist <clears throat> late distal convoluted tubule, back through an early distal convoluted tubule, down the ascending limb of the loop of Henley, around the hairpin turn, up the descending limb of the loop of Henley, through the proximal convoluted tubule into Bowman's capsule, where then it can measure the fluid going by that probe. No, thank you. <laughs> now, if that's not a drinking game, I don't know what is. You've heard <laughs> cops pulling people over and telling them tell say the alphabet in reverse, I would fail. But I would turn to that officer and say, I can tell you the anatomical structures a probe would pass if we inserted a catheter through someone's urethra all the way back to Bowman's capsule in reverse. That's what I just did. I know my renal anatomy. So that's a very invasive thing, right? I'm here, uh, my job is to now prove to you why inulin 
this special plant polysaccharide, a lot like starch, a lot like fiber. We can't digest it, but our body can filter it and get rid of it in urine. How is that useful to us? I inject inulin into my patient. Okay, it's an injection, but still this is pretty non-invasive. It's no worse than an immunization. I inject them with inulin, a known amount of inulin. This inulin I inject goes into their bloodstream. I ask the patient to do a few cartwheels, some somersaults to ensure good proper mixing into their blood. I'm kidding. A little laughter here, pay attention. So the inulin mixes in their blood. I draw blood and send it to the lab. <clears throat> Just because I know how much I injected into my patient does not mean I know the concentration of that inulin in my patient's blood. Why? Sarah, Mary Ann, John, Jonathan, if you all stood in front of your camera, we would all be able to see that you ha all have different body sizes. Yes. You would have different amounts of blood. Yes. If I, if I injected 30 milligrams into you all, different concentration. you all would have a different starting concentration because you have different blood volumes. Got right. it? So I have to draw blood from my patient, yep. send it to the lab, and they tell me the concentration. They tell me how much I start with, how many bullets are on the floor. Then I start collecting urine from my patient, say over two hours. Maybe it's one hour. Maybe it's a 24 hour sample, but I start collecting urine and I measure how much I collected in this amount of time. That's my urine flow rate. I can send that urine sample to the lab and they can tell me how much inulin, that's the little I here, <clears throat> came out. They can tell me the concentration, milligrams per milliliter. If I multiply the urine flow rate times the urine concentration, I know how much is excreted. Let me go back. I can figure out how much is excreted by measuring how much urine comes out, say in an hour, and multiplying it by the urine concentration of inulin that the lab tells me came out in my patient's urine. Good? Yeah. I also can calculate filtration rate, filtered load, tubular load. How do I do that? I need to multiply GFR times the plasma concentration of inulin. That's all I need to do. Because inulin is filtered only, whatever is filtered comes out in the urine. Matchy matchy, equal sign. Hmm. Can I collect urine and send it to the lab? Yes. And they, they can tell me how much I collected in an hour. Can they tell me how much inulin came out in that urine? Absolutely. Can I draw blood and send it to the lab and they can tell me how much inulin was in the plasma to begin with? Oh yes, they can. What's the one thing I don't know? GFR. GFR. It's one thing I don't know. All the other three things I can, I can find out. So can I rearrange this equation? Can I put GFR by itself, isolate it by itself and calculate it? Absolutely. Yes. It'll be GFR equals urine flow rate times the urine concentration of inulin 
over my plasma concentration of inulin. Huh, where have I seen that before? What comes out divided by what I start with? Where have I seen that? Hmm. Fairness. It's the same equation, but notice the power. Notice, <clears throat> notice the substitution. I used a substance that was filtered only. And because it was filtered only, filtered will equal excretion. Three of those four things are easy for me to figure out from a lab report. The only thing I didn't know based on my equation and using substitution was GFR. And when I solved for GFR, <clears throat> again, the trick is I used inulin. It was also the equation for renal clearance value. The renal clearance value for inulin is also going to give me my patient's actual GFR. <clears throat> no probe necessary, just an injection, draw some blood, collect P. So here it is again. Here it is again. What's filtered will equal excretion. Why? Because inulin is only filtered. And in my master equation, I got rid of the other math I don't need to worry about. And I use substitution. What's another way I can calculate excretion? Urine flow rate times the urine concentration of inulin. How do I calculate filtered load? Plasma concentration of inulin times GFR. Three of these things I can figure out the only one I can't really figure out directly, I can solve mathematically. Oh, math is a really good thing. <laughs> and it turns out this equation where we're solving for GFR using inulin is the e renal clearance value equation. How useful is that? Here's a practice problem. This is part of what you're going to be doing tonight. The doctor suspects her patient has kidney damage and has inulin infused into his vein. She then recovers 0.5 milligrams per milliliter of inulin in his blood plasma. So she sent his blood to the lab and they said, here's his starting concentration. Okay. And here's his concentration in his urine. So that's part of what's coming out. And here's how much urine he made, two milliliters per minute. <clears throat> so here's out times out over start. And this patient has a GFR of 120 milliliters per minute. That doesn't sound too far off from 125. For our class, for normal, okay, for normal, we are going to stick to about a plus or minus five milliliters <clears throat> as being normal. So that means 120 milliliters to about 130 milliliters per minute, we will consider normal. Okay. Now <clears throat> the National Kidney Foundation has their own set of standards for rating someone's renal uh, function. And they look at GFR. And by the way, they look at your GFR based on race, <clears throat> based on age, based on gender. It sounds like it's a very racist, sexist thing. But <clears throat> the fact is, um, men have more blood volume, so they're starting with more of something potentially than women. And some races <clears throat> uh, have predispositions to having um, more renal issues. 
okay? Uh, and, and by the way, it's also linked to having a greater disposition for diabetes. So they take that into, into account. <clears throat> so if you're African-American, for example, they already are factoring in that genetically, there's an issue already with predisposition towards these renal issues and diabetic issues. So they're already factoring it in to find a new normal. It's not, it's not supposed to be racist. It's just looking at a population that has historically had different renal function. It's not just African-American. It's also Asian descent. And, and Anyway, don't, don't make this a political or racial thing. This is a genetic issue and medical issue. And we're trying to adjust to find a new normal for a specific population, male versus female, age, <clears throat> after age 30, 10% decline for every decade, right? I'm already in early stage renal failure. Now they're evaluating me among 50 year olds. How good am I among 50 year old females? I think you get the idea. So please do not memorize this National Kidney Foundation chart. I just put it here so you can get an idea <clears throat> next time you get your blood and urine analysis done and they are estimating your GFR and they, they, they might flag you, they might not, and they, they say to you a normal range. Here's your range for your age and your ethnicity. That's what they're doing. They're, it's a sliding scale. How normal are you for your age and your ethnicity? Okay. <clears throat> I have a couple more slides and then we'll take our break. And when you get back from your break, we're gonna do a lot of math. It'll be fun. So, <laughs> start drinking on my break I'm yeah renal yeah, clearance. Right. <laughs> clearance now how many of you have had blood and urine analysis done arguably almost all of you and if you go and pull up your data if you pull up your your forms maybe they mailed it to you maybe you have an electronic chart pull it up somewhere in those pages of data you will have something that says E, G, F, R. They have calculated your GFR. And you might be saying to me, Kara, I don't remember being injected with inulin. And I'm going to say to you, you're right. Because there's an alternative. There's another substance we can use, actually quite a few of them. But there's one in particular I want you to know as a substitute for inulin. This means less of a hassle to get a patient to report to a clinical setting and being injected with inulin and then having blood drawn and their urine collected. Now, the, subst the substitute is creatinine. Oh. It's, en it's endogenous. This is something I don't have to inject. It's already in you. And it has a very similar fate to inulin. So it's a pretty good substitute, but it's not perfect. It's good enough. It's about 90% perfect, okay? And that's why they give you an eGFR. It stands for estimated GFR because creatinine is 90% comparable to inulin. It's almost just as good as inulin. Why isn't it just as good as inulin? Because a very small amount of creatinine is secreted. It has a slightly different fate. Not a lot of it is secreted, about 10%, which is why creatinine is about 90% perfect when we compare it to inulin. Are you getting it? So if you have an EGFR test result, will it be a little bit skewed than like those a little bit? Because yeah. so I'm not on a personal level because I have an EGFR and my numbers were a little bit lower, lower than what I expected or overestimate. Oh, okay, just kidding. It's going to be a slight overestimation of renal uh, function. In other words, we're giving you a better benefit of the doubt for your renal function. Now, Sarah, here's yes, the thing. Here's the thing, 
because because we know it's 90 percent perfect when they do the egfr they're already back calculating they're already they're already okay. correcting for that 90 percent perfection okay so that, so that egfr is okay. already back calculating as if they used inulin gotcha because they didn't use inulin, they still have to say it's an estimate. Okay. 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 Hmm. All right. All right. Interesting. So for testing purposes, I want you all to know you can use creatinine instead of inulin. You must know it's endogenous. It's something already in your body. I don't have to inject it. It is a byproduct of muscle metabolism. It is a waste product. It is freely filtered, but it is also a little bit, like 10% of it is secreted. So remember I said, here's my, here's my inulin. It's getting filtered, but some of it escaped. And that plasma might have to take several trips through the kidney before it's completely cleared because inulin only has the fate of being filtered. But creatinine, a little bit of it, just a little bit, is also being secreted. So it will be cleared from your body a little bit faster than inulin, but we can adjust for that because we know exactly how much is secreted. It's only about 10%. That's why I keep saying creatinine is about 90% perfect compared to inulin. It's almost there. It's still, it's still in the A range, but it's, it's, it's going to give us a slight overestimation of the person's renal function. And the clinical laboratory back calculates and does adjust for that. Makes sense. Okay. Now, I want to tell you about another substance that has a totally different fate, and this is called PAH. PAH stands for para-amino puric acid. It is filtered and secreted. So let me go to my master equation. Excretion equals filtration plus secretion minus reabsorption, but PAH is not reabsorbed. Make the math easier. One less thing for me to worry about. So now I have E equals F plus S. I know, I know an alternative for calculating E. I can multiply urine flow rate times the urine concentration I know how to calculate filtered load, that's GFR times the plasma concentration. I just don't know how to calculate secretion. But I can rearrange this. Can't I substitute V times U for E? Can't I substitute GFR times P for F? Can't I rearrange my equation and solve for secretion? I can. Oh, Kara, this seems like it's going to be a multiple step process. It is. It is. Why do we care about PAH in this lecture? It's its fate. It's filtered and secreted. Let's say you calculated a person's GFR, either using inulin or creatinine, and let's say their GFR came down to be 90 milliliters per minute. And for their age, ethnicity, and gender, this was far too low, not normal. They have renal failure. Last week, I told you, okay, where, where is this coming from? Is it pre-renal? Is it a blood flow issue to the kidney? How can the kidneys do their job if they're not getting adequate blood flow? 
Is it intrarenal? Are the nephrons failing? Is there glomerular nephritis? Is there nephritic or nephrotic syndrome? Is the filtration membrane, un is it something in the kidney? Is it post-renal? Well, pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal. I need to know because depending on where that problem is dictates how I, the healthcare provider, help my patient. If it's pre-renal failure, then I gotta go after blood flow. Is there an obstruction? Is the heart weak? I gotta fix it there. If it's intrarenal, well, there's not a lot I can do short of a kidney transplant. Is it post-renal failure? Are we talking about a man that has prosthetic hypertrophy, prostate cancer? All right, let's remove that prostate then. Where the problem is dictates how we help our patient. I, I don't know another way to say that. Wherever the problem is, whatever the etiology, whatever the source, where we find that problem beginning, that's where we go after it. PAH is helpful to us if and when we find out our patient's GFR is low, then PAH helps us find out if it's a blood flow problem if it's pre-renal. So that's our next step. We rule out pre-renal and using PAH helps us do that. In unit four, I'm just going to say this because most of you haven't really got, gotten into unit four, but in unit four, in the renal section, so early unit four, in the next two weeks, you're going to learn about Goldblatt hypertension. And Goldblatt hypertension is a person that has very high blood pressure, but it started because the kidneys sounded the alarm. The kidneys have this exquisite way. Oh my gosh, it's such a beautiful story. The kidneys are amazing how they do their job. If the kidneys don't get adequate oxygen, you learned in unit one that they release a hormone. Which hormone? Interpreting. Right. And then red blood cell count goes up and they get more oxygen. Mm -hmm. These damn kidneys, they also have a way of detecting if they're getting adequate blood flow. Oh. You see, they have capabilities very similar to baroreceptors. Remember baroreceptors in the aortic arch and carotid sinus, they could detect the amount of stretch, stroke volume went up, stretch went up, resulting output heart rate went down, remember? The kidneys have this similar capability, similar. They can detect if they're getting adequate blood flow they have pressure receptors and other things. And if they could talk to you, they would say, we need this capability because we have to filter the blood multiple times a day. If you want us to do our job, we need a lot of blood flow per day. And the kidneys are not a lot, they are not about, they're like not on our watch. If they don't get adequate blood flow, oh my goodness, they release the hounds of hell. They will release so many chemical signals to increase blood volume, blood pressure, because they know Ohm's law. If they increase volume, they increase pressure, if I increase pressure, I increase flow, don't I? And if the kidneys get adequate blood flow, they can do their job. So Goldblatt hypertension, excuse the sirens, I live right next to a fire department. Um, 
Goldblatt hypertension, a person has really high blood pressure. And when you find really high blood pressure in a person whose GFR, a flow, is low, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Look, you just took an exam on unit three. You know Ohm's law. Flow is directly related to pressure. If someone's blood pressure is elevated, flow should be increased. GFR is a flow. If their blood pressure is high and yet flow, GFR, is low, that does not compute. That doesn't make sense. And now you know your disconnect. The kidneys are not getting adequate blood flow. They're not able to filter effectively. And they are releasing the hounds of hell, these chemical signals to get blood volume and blood pressure kicked up way high just to bring GFR back up. High, high blood pressure, low GFR, all comes down to Goldblatt's hypertension. And in one of the lectures for unit four, you're gonna learn about Dr. Goldblatt and how he learned that the kidneys really get, they get really, they're the crankiest organ in your body. I like to think they're just cranky. They get all pissy if they can't do their job. <laughs> and then all hell breaks loose in the body. And Dr. Goldblatt used his own family dog to measure renal function in his own family dog. Why did he use his own family dog? He was a poor scientist. He didn't have enough funding. So he couldn't get enough dogs to do these studies. He used his own dog for crying out loud. Isn't that amazing? It's awful, I know, but that's what he did. So I have some pretty intense math to show you and I need you to have a pretty good disposition. So I want you to, I want you to go have a break. I'll see you at 8.35. And okay. then when you come back, be ready to do some math. We're not going to do all the math tonight. You're going to do it to a certain point with me online. And once you get past a certain point, I can say, all right, you finished the hardest one. That is the hardest one I can ever give you. Do the rest on your own because we've done the hardest one together. Okay, so I'll see you in 10 minutes. Okay. So this idea of Goldblatt hypertension, until you learn more about it, it takes still considerable amounts of lecture to understand how the kidneys release these chemical signals into the body to get blood volume and blood pressure up. Um, until we learn about that, please know that they are capable of this. How, what they do, you will learn. You will be thoroughly abused with it. Uh, but until then, just know <clears throat> that the kidneys take it very seriously, their job. If they are expected to filter your plasma about 80 times a day, they need adequate blood flow. And they're going to make sure that happens come hell or high water. So if we determine using inulin or creatinine that a patient has a low GFR, that tells us renal failure. Now we have to figure out, is it pre, intra, or post renal? Post renal, that's easy. Is it a man? Check the prostate. <clears throat> is it a man or woman? Check the prostate of man and check for a kidney stone, a renal calculus, something obstructing urine output. We can do imaging for that. It's not hard to take care of these things, remove the prostate, get rid of the kidney stone. <clears throat> we have ways of handling post renal failure. Okay renal failure. We need to figure out if that's happening. Enter PAH. PAH will let us figure out <clears throat> three things. 
EAH will directly help us calculate a person's ERPF, effective renal plasma flow, which should be 594 milliliters per minute. And then we can back calculate and calculate someone's RPF and RBF, renal blood flow. Renal blood flow should be 1,200 milliliters per minute of whole blood going to, through, and out of the kidneys. Is it 1,200 or is it considerably lower than that? Is it only half of that? Well, if it's half of what it should be, no wonder they have a low GFR. That explains why they have a low GFR. Now we go after the flow issue. Is there a plaque in the renal artery, an arthrosclerotic plaque? Do they have anorexia and they've lost their perirenal fat pads? The perirenal fat pads keep the kidneys buoyant. They come off of the aorta at roughly a 90 degree angle. But if you lose that perirenal fat pad, the kidneys sink. And if you think of my arm as the renal artery coming off of my body as the aorta, it's a kink. It's like kinking a hose. Well, if you crimp a hose, how much water do you get out at the end of the hose? Very little. So if we calculate a low GFR and yet the patient has high blood pressure and we calculate a low ERPF, low RPF, low RBF, we, we've now isolated the problem. It's a blood flow problem. Let's go after it and fix it. That's a lot easier than a kidney transplant. So you see, it's easy for us to go after post-renal, relatively easy to go after pre-renal, very limited option when it's intra-renal. <clears throat> Here is why. This is my job. This is my job to prove to you why PAH with its fate can be used to calculate ERPF and then indirectly RPF, or I should say subsequently, not to be confused with the subsequent movie film by Borat. Anyway, subsequently RPF and RBF. <laughs> Clearly some of you have not seen that movie. I couldn't get past the first 10 minutes. I watched about 20. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I couldn't. The new one that came out? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I just I just couldn't. It's some part, uh. I maybe when I'm not in physio I can, but it was I had to just start to study. I was like, this is too much, and it's now, and I could laugh. Was it that bad? It's, it's not that it's bad. It's bad. It's very. Just, there were parts that were extremely uh, uncomfortable to watch. Yes, like okay. cringeworthy. Okay, but I uh, but I also am yeah. But then. Oh. There were parts, as my oldest son Thank described, you. that were very endearing and warming oh, and yes. actually true, actually true. Yes. Anyway, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, anyway, maybe next year we can watch it. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. <sighs> okay. Back to the math. Okay. Here, please look at this picture of this kidney. Here's our way in. Okay. There's only one way into the kidney, and that's through the renal artery, through the blood. But there are two ways out. Something can either come out of the renal vein or out in the urine. Okay, those are the two ways out. Now, <clears throat> PAH is not um, endogenous. PAH, like inulin, is something we inject. <clears throat> and we inject a very small amount, and here's why. And this part's important. We inject a small amount to ensure that the PAH that goes in only comes out in the urine. If we inject a small amount, 
then whatever enters the kidney will come out in the urine. It won't escape through the renal vein. Again, it's we ensure that we don't over inject. And we've done those studies. We know it, it only takes this little amount for us to determine effective renal plasma flow. So here's my math proof. <clears throat> in, in PAH <clears throat> will equal out in the urine. If we don't over inject, none will come out through the renal vein, okay? So over here, this is out through urine. This is out through vein. And this is in through artery. All right, what goes in must come out. If I don't over inject, then the amount of PAH exiting in the renal vein, that's what RV stands for, would be zero. Zero times anything zero. is what? Zero. Zero. So what does that mean? I just made the math easier for myself. This, this, this disappears, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what comes in in the renal artery will match what comes out in the urine. Okay, how do I calculate what comes out in the urine? That's excretion. And that is urine flow rate times the urine concentration of PAH. We've been through this. Can I collect urine? Yes. Can I send it to the lab and they tell me how much PAH comes out of it? Yes, I can. So check and check, those are easy to find out. <clears throat> concentration of PAH in the renal artery. Let me say that another way. The concentration of PAH in the blood. That's what that is. Can I draw blood and send it to the lab and they tell me my starting concentration of PAH? Yes, I can. What's the only thing I don't know in this equation directly? ERPF. Why is it ERPF? Let me back up. PAH, when I inject it, is in the plasma. That's where it is. And if I inject such a small amount, then PAH will be filtered and secreted 100% from that plasma say on the first turn through the kidney. That's like me having Hayden and Evan and a few other friends helping me pick up bullets. If we're bending over picking one bullet at a time and I have all of these helpers, we finish at the same time that Mac acting alone when he picks up the lightsabers. Think of me and all of those kids helping me pick up the bullets as filtration <laughs> plus secretion. And we're going to clear that carpet a lot faster. A lot faster. So ERPF, the amount of blood delivered to the kidneys for the sake of being filtered. So can I figure out urine flow rate? Yeah. Can I figure out urine concentration of PAH? Yes. Can I figure out blood concentration of PAH? <clears throat> Raw blood. What's the one thing I don't know? The patient's actual ERPF, which should be 594. Let me rearrange this equation. ERPF will equal urine flow rate times the urine concentration of PAH divided by the blood concentration of PAH. Oh my gosh, where did I see that equation before of out divided by start? It's the renal clearance equation. It's the same equation, but when I use PAH in that equation, because of PAH's fate of being filtered and secreted, 
when I use PAH and its values in that equation, it tells me the patient's ERPF. And then I can back calculate to RPF and RBF. And I can figure out if that patient's renal blood flow is 1200 milliliters per minute, or is it considerably lower? Then that explains the renal failure. We are at the point where I need to shut up and you need to practice because I've just thrown so many concepts at you and equations, you need to practice. That's what we're gonna do for the rest of our 30 minutes together. Inulin, creatinine, a close second. When we use it in the renal clearance equation, tells us a person's GFR. Should be 125 milliliters per minute. Why can we use inulin and creatinine? Because of their fates. PAH, when I use it in the renal clearance equation, gives me the person's ER, PF, and then after that, you'll realize tonight, I can figure out RPF, and then after that, RBF. Glucose, should glucose ever be cleared from your plasma? No, not as a diabetes. Uh -uh. So it has a clearance of zero milliliters per minute. We never clear glucose from our plasma. We never do. Sodium, do we clear that from our plasma? Some of you seem to think it does because of what you wrote in your relationship for or exam three. Some of you told me that there's, because the sodium potassium ATPase is blocked by Digitalis, there's no sodium outside the cell, and I about lost my mind. Oh, no. <coughs> yes, there is. Uh, sodium is the most abundant cation, most abundant electrolyte in the plasma. Uh, it doesn't just come from the inside of cells, it's also from our diet. We don't clear sodium from our plasma. It is almost, it's dangerously close to zero. It's always in our plasma. It's just a question of how much. Urea. Urea is a waste product. You'd think we would have that cleared at like a higher value, a lot more milliliters per minute. 70? 70 is less than inulin. So here, this is really important. If something say urea, has a clearance less than inulin, if anything has a clearance less than inulin, it tells you that substance has another fate. They're reabsorbed. Isn't that weird? Urea, a waste product, is filtered and reabsorbed. It's waste. Why do we reabsorb it? Why would we reabsorb it? What a delicious question. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for the answer. Never mind. <laughs> turns out, turns out urea is a very useful waste. Very useful. Urea helps us make a supra concentrated urine during times when we're dehydrated. Oh, okay. Your body keeps some of, your body keeps some of it around for that sake. So it turns out, yeah, it's waste, but it's, it's a helpful waste when you need it. You're going to learn more about that. Is it's, that the one that's broken down when we metabolize the amino acids or yeah. is that the nucleic acid? That's the amino acid. Okay. Correct. Okay. Oh. If something has a clearance higher than inulin, it tells you it has a fate different from inulin in that it's not just filtered, it's also secreted. So that's why you're clearing more plasma of that substance. So low clearance, you're filtering and you're reabsorbing. Higher clearance, you're filtering and you're secreting. You're really getting rid of it. Okay. 
This is the slide that has all of your equations. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven equations. Seven. So now I want you to please open your notebook. And here, here's where you all being on Zoom can actually be a really good thing. I'm okay. going to stop. No, really, I'm, I'm going to explain why. And I'm going to stop recording so that you feel more comfortable. <laughs>